Good evening. I'm Sheila Tainter, and on behalf of Storm Surge and our co-sponsor, Newburyport Livable Streets, I would like to welcome you to our second program in our Fall 2020 speaker series, Climate Change and the Benefits of Green Infrastructure. All around the world, communities are experiencing the impacts of climate change, hotter temperatures, drought in some places, as well as more frequent heavy rains and runoff in others more intense storms and rising sea levels. And all around the world, planners and designers are coming up with measures to cope with these impacts. We're fortunate to have with us tonight someone who has extensive experience dealing with these issues and can introduce us to the concept of green infrastructure and how we can use proven strategies to make our community more resilient. I am so pleased to introduce you to Bob Ulig a landscape architect and urban designer who lives here in Newburyport. Bob Ulig is a principal at Halverson Tie and Bond Studio, a landscape architecture, planning and urban design practice based in Boston. He has many years of experience planning projects ranging from parks, waterfronts and streetscapes to commercial, residential and campus landscapes. He has led the design and project management for a variety of sophisticated multidisciplinary projects that solve site design and engineering challenges and involve the seamless integration of art, architecture, and natural systems. Bob says that his greatest satisfaction comes from working collaboratively with clients and consultants on projects involving the incorporation of art and architecture into the natural landscape ecology. In addition to his professional practice, Bob contributes his expertise to a variety of public organizations focused on design and improving the public realm. He serves as a mayoral appointment to the Revere Beach Design Review Board and Suffolk Downs Revere Design Advisory Committee, as well as on the East Boston Greenway Council Board of Directors. Bob also serves on the Landscape Architectural Advisory Board and as a periodic guest lecturer and critic for Boston Architectural College and Roger Williams University, and is a frequent speaker at industry conferences. Bob has also had an impact locally. He has served on the Newburyport Parks Commission, the Newburyport Community Preservation Committee, and is chair of the Newburyport Redevelopment Authority. After Bob's presentation, there will be a Q&A but during the presentation, Sarah Tappan and Heather Lipp will be monitoring questions in the chat window. So please feel free to ask any questions there as they come up. If you're having technical difficulties, let them know in chat and they'll help. And now please welcome Bob Ulig, who will share with us what is being done in other places to deal with climate change and what we can do right here in Newburyport to confront our own climate changes. Thank you, Sheila. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining, and I hope you find this a fun and informative way to spend your, uh, your COVID-free Thursday evening. Uh, I wanted to start by uh, dedicating this talk to a good friend and Christian mentor, Don Bade, who was a prior president of the local Parker River Clean Water Association and passed away this week. And it's ironic that we're discussing a topic, you know, that is pretty close and near to dear to his heart and what his focus was. So, and as for me, you know, as Sheila said, I've, I'm going and going on to, I can't believe it, but I'm going on to my 35th year as a practicing landscape architect. Uh, 33 of those years, um, having relocated here from the mid-Atlantic states and living in Newburyport and working uh, in Boston, both of which are, you know, adjacent to the river and adjacent to the ocean has made me more keenly attuned to kind of patterns and changes uh, to kind of the living and breathing environment that's around us all the time. Um, and it's enhanced my interest and passion in climate change and how we can better follow the lead of natural systems where possible to guide solutions to the challenges we face. Um, and I hope to show you that, you know, that uh, uh, these green infrastructure can have multiple benefits beyond just protection, but they can provide social benefits, economic benefits and environmental benefits. So, I'll, I'll warn you ahead of time, I'm hoping that this isn't too much of a fire hose because I got a lot of information to talk about, but I've got a lot of broad experience in a lot of areas, but master of very few of them. So uh, let's go for the go for the ride here. Uh, so agenda wise, just going to look briefly at climate change and projections. I know a lot of these we've seen and I think we get desensitized to, but 
I think there, some of them are worth repeating again to set the stage. Secondarily, we're gonna look at a variety of climate focused planning initiatives that I, that in my experience being in Boston have really ramped up and are starting to kind of get more traction over the past 10 years. Uh, we're gonna look at a couple of case studies that we've worked on, my firm has worked on, um, that I hope you find interesting. Then we're gonna look at a couple of visionary case studies. We're gonna come back in and look at kind of some opportunities to do some more modest implementations here in Newburyport. And then gonna just tee up for you guys who maybe have more interest in this topic, look at some local thought leaders and opportunities associated with that. So to start with kind of, again, reminders of what are, you know, what are these signs of climate change that are all around us? Some of them which are subtle, uh, and some of which are more obvious. And I think the more important thing is, you know, what are the tangible impacts that we, some of which we have seen, but some of which we have yet to see on how the way we live our lives, our health and our overall well-being. So um, I just wanted to show you this diagram, which I find is kind of interesting and compelling at the same time. So uh, the first time you won't get it, but you see it goes from a bluer to a redder, which is showing kind of from 1880 to 2017, the trend uh, towards a warming of temperatures in, in the, yeah, across the globe. So I think that that was one that people have commonly heard of. In addition, along with this temperature, it's all interrelated such that, you know, what is expected to happen with the effects of climate change will be because of warming temperatures and the change in the way the atmosphere is able to absorb water, there'll be an increase in precipitation intensity. Um, and a larger portion of the rainfall will occur in shorter periods of time. I think we've seen that, you know, here in other areas where there's more, uh, it may not, it may, we have, may, may have longer periods of drought, but then when we have rainfall, it's much more intense than we're historically used to it being. And you'll note here on this chart where it's blue is areas where the climate models predict an increase in intensity by the end of the 21st century. We happen to be in one of those pretty darker blue areas and the brown tends to be where there's gonna be increased drought. Um, one that is more common given that we live closer to the coast is the concepts of sea level rise. And you see there's a variety of data that are proving this out from uh, kind of historic records, tide gauges more in current times from the 1900s up to the present, and now satellite data is also proving that out. You know, in the Boston area, the general projections, although they are often in flux, everybody's kind of agreed at this point that by 2030, which is now not even 10 years away, that we'll have nine inches of sea level rise. Uh, another 40 years down the road in 2070, we'll have another 18 inches for 27 inches of sea level rise. And by the end of the century, there's anticipated being 40 plus inches of sea level rise change. So, you know, how do we start to think about that and how do we deal with that? Uh, another topic that doesn't get discussed as much is um, CO2 emissions and discharge. And it's interesting to see that, you know, we are amongst the nations of China, Russia, uh, Germany, Japan, that are highest in outputters of CO2 emissions, again, changing the atmosphere around us. And those that are highest impacted are those that are not producing it, but are those countries such as Central Africa, uh, Asia, and kind of the South Pacific. And overall, so how do we think about these climate changes? So I like to think about this dial from the inside out. So more extreme weather, sea level rise, increased CO2, rising temperatures, all have impacts on our health, whether it be through impacts in water quality and availability of water, you know, as we get to have a lot more issues about water rights, the availability of food supply as we get larger populations, as we have environmental degradation, the things we talked about, extreme heat, severe weather, all of which has the potential to increasingly impact our health. So how do we kind of, how do we take uh, measures, even if they be subtle measures, how do we walk before we run and take measures in that regard. So we're gonna look a little bit at some climate change mitigation trends over time and then turning into strategies and then related resources. So being in Boston, I have, I'm fortunate to be involved with an organization called Urban Lands Institute. And about five to seven years ago, Urban Land Institute, as soon as sea level rise started becoming an issue with storm, uh, with uh, uh, tropical or with the superstorm Sandy, and some of the other storms that we've seen along the East Coast, which hasn't been as severe in Boston, but have in other areas, have brought to attention some of these issues. And so 
uh, Urban Land Institute, which is composed of a lot of uh, real estate related professionals uh, put together with the funding of ULI, a study about living with water. And so it started to think about, you know, this not being a possibility, but being an inevitability. inevitability. And so while it was a bit visionary in its thinking, it got us to think about how do we live and how do we accommodate some of these uh, inevitable climate changes. And so while this is a bit, you know, extreme in its notion, if we look down the road, you know, this is a picture of Back Bay. I think it's the Berkeley Street was the idea as we have climate change. And the interesting thing about climate change is that the areas that we have filled through time are the places that the sea is is most strident in its places of taking it back. That's partially because those areas of fill haven't been filled that much. Um, but those are the areas that are most vulnerable to sea level rise. So the idea of Back Bay being a modern day uh, Venice is something that may be, you know, on the on the long distance horizon. Uh, in more recent times, the ULI then followed that study up with the idea that it's not just a water issue that we're faced with, but there's also uh, changes, as we talked about with the change in temperature, there's an increase in heat and particularly in urban environments. So this graphic on the right-hand side shows you, you know, as in the Boston area on the far right around the harbor, you know, where the city is most dense, where tree canopy is the least, where the most amount of impervious surface occurs is where the heat island heat island effect is going to take its you know its biggest effect and so what are the visionary kind of counter effects we have to that and so that report in in amongst looked at a variety of different neighborhoods around boston and looked at the idea you know in east boston at the idea that maybe as as we move through time we think about our transportation and the, maybe the lead the need for less roads uh, and if we think about transforming some of our roads selectively into public open space, they can be cooling environments, they can be places of enhanced quality of life and better habitat to counteract the heat island effect. So these were early on kind of inspirational uh, studies that were done. More recently, that has all initiated kind of a, a, a mayor initiated study called Climate Ready Boston that looks at Overall, overall city of Boston and where, uh, not just the water's edges, but where is the city overall impacted um, by climate change? And the city has gone from an overall study to looking at a series of different neighborhood studies one by one, and to look at the measures that need to take place in those areas to both protect and, and use the, those protections as a means of enhancing those communities. We've been fortunate to work on this area in the center, which is the South Boston neighborhood. And I'm gonna zoom into that now. And so it, as a part of that study, um, uh, the South Boston neighborhood com is composed of a lot of, a lot of varied uh, neighborhoods and areas. The original historic neighborhood is the residential neighborhood you see kind of more in gray and white in the middle. And that just so happens to be on the highest layer area of land. The other areas of land within the dotted line are mostly the areas that we as humans have filled, which was formerly sea. And so those are the areas, as I mentioned earlier, that are most vulnerable uh, to sea level rise and storm surge. And so this map identifies first with the black lines with arrows, where are those points along the shoreline that are right now, today, most vulnerable to flood pathways uh, when we have king high tides, when we have king high tides in association with storm surges. And so the kind of darkest blue are the areas right now where they're experiencing flooding conditions in and around South Boston. As they get, as the areas get lighter, uh, that becomes the, the kind of next projection. The next lightest area is kind of 2030, and then the even lighter area is 2070. One of the interesting ironies, if you know it, so this goes kind of from South Boston, Castle Island. This is Massport's uh, uh, Connolly Terminal where much of the shipping containers come in and out. This is kind of maritime area. And then this is the more recently developed seaport, which ironically enough, it, a lot of this development was permitted prior to the last recession. So it all kind of occurred and was developed before kind of the awareness of sea level rise and climate change has come to pass. So now retroactively, these these property owners are having to think about how do they protect their properties and enhance them. Um, this is Fort Point Channel that's adjacent to South Station. And Fort Point Channel's vulnerability uh, connects to the Massachusetts Turnpike, which is a low spot such that 
if the uh, four point channel over overtops, it has the ability to flood all of Back Bay as the Mass Pike is kind of a, a boat lowered boat section where the water could make its way easily down uh, towards Alston Bright. So as we look at, uh, uh, again, a little bit more deeply at this is Sport Point Channel at a king tide. Um, and I'm gonna show you a couple of, kind of head into some of the examples that we looked at. There's a variety of different examples of how one thinks about protect, protection. In addition to protection, how do we create public amenity where we're also investing in infrastructure? So there's this, these slides, whether it be Chicago River Walk, whether it be Hudson River Park, which is more of a green uh, solution, Oslo, uh, Toronto Waterfront, they all combine investments in infrastructure with improvements in quality of life uh, and enhancements in some cases to the environment. So as we think about some of these uh, solutions that are available to us, they come across a range of approaches and then there's sub approaches within that, but I'm gonna kind of touch on this lightly tonight uh, given the time frame, So one that's the most straightforward of how do we create protection in infrastructure is through essentially a vertical seawall that protects us with the water out and the, the uh, inland side in of that seawall. The next strategy would be to you not know, focus on keeping the water out from the land's edge, but uh, focused on uh, water tighting our buildings and the structures so water cannot penetrate inboard. Those are kind of two structural solutions. Now we're gonna look at kind of two more green infrastructure solutions. The next one is what's called kind of a raised harbor walk or park space in which the existing land edge is here, the water is outboard of it. And what we do is we create a raised levee uh, and landform to keep the water out. And also again, to pro hopefully provide more than just that, we provide public amenity, a place where people can gather, maybe a people, a place where there's a route along the water's edge, so it's a place of transit as well. So this one kind of respects the water's edge. One of the things that we're faced with in kind of uh, modern day, which hasn't been up till now, hasn't been perceived as uh, permittable, is the idea of constructed ground, where in some instances we're restricted how much we can do inland, and so the possibility of doing more landfilling uh, into the water to help do protection and also create additional green infrastructure into the water. And the last one is kind of a raising our transportation uh, up out of the water and our navigation so that, uh, so that it protects it. So I'm gonna just show you quickly kind of what do those solutions look like. So vertical seawall, kind of like Joppa Park, we think of as a pretty straightforward concrete structure. That could also take a more artful form as you see at the bottom, again, a protective structure, but using some kind of a Corten steel element which is more attractive. Um, protection of buildings, you know, essentially envelopes uh, and, and windows and doors that have sealants and, and are designed uh, to protect against floodwaters. A building with potentially deployable doors that also provide additional protection. Uh, on the land side, thinking again of these kind of raised solutions that protect, some can be more hardscape like you see at the bottom, or they can be uh, more of a green uh, infiltrating nature, and again, contribute to the, the ecology and the environment on the upper right hand side. Then the kind of landfilling forms where we think about, and you can see these little vignettes on the right hand side, those can take the place of kind of constructed dunes, constructed barrier, a, a salt marsh, which is built out into the water's edge, and or a constructed harbor wall. So you, what you're seeing is, there's kind of a, a toolkit that one can use. And then as we think about the navigational areas that are protected, uh, you may be familiar with kind of um, uh, tide gates that have been created here um, in the Netherlands, also a similar one being created uh, um, outside of um, Venice, and then deployable structures uh, that protect temporarily against, against climate change and sea level rise. I think that, you know, the one point I wanna make is that what we've learned and what we're learning is, is that it's not a one size fits all, but that as we look around sites, there's a lot of variability. So you incorporate, end up incorporating a variety of different solutions uh, to create an overall barrier. And the other thing is, is that um, a lot of solutions have been coming about site by site, but what we're learning is, is that 
it's important that we achieve regional solutions that protect an entire area. That requires a lot of planning and a lot of coordination because if it's a site by site solution, essentially your weakest link is the place where you know you have vulnerability. So I'm just going to show you again now we zoom in a little bit on the South Boston study that we did and there's a series of different kind of strategies that we assessed and work with the city on. So there's a strategy A which is um, uh, what protects the most which is right at the water's edge and the assessment of the cost of kind of that type of a strategy. Um, and that strategy protects some things and then allows other things outboard of it to be more vulnerable. There's a yellow strategy that then is more expensive but protects essentially everything because it encompasses all along the edge. And so then kind of zooming into this area right adjacent to Fan Pier, just showing, showing you a couple of those and how they could be implemented uh, in terms of, you know, again, there's not one solution, but a variety of options to be considered kind of along the existing edge of Fan Pier, the idea of introducing a vertical seawall or taking a more green infrastructure approach where you capture some of that, uh, what was marina and create larger open space that can be floodable and can uh, contain some of the water as well and modifications to the marina or a solution that protects the entire area where you bring that again the barrier around the outside and you protect everything inboard of the marina and such so again kind of just showing you again of along four point channel similar kind of thing it creates thinking of kind of this toolkit of solutions and how you tie those those toolkit of solutions to create a continual regional strategy now I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer to give you a real idea of kind of on the ground what it feels like. This is a, this is a study we looked at at the Children's Museum, if you know where that is, along Fort Point Channel. That's the building to the right, Fort Point Channel on the left. And this kind of shows you kind of existing grade uh, on the left of the Harbor Walk, which you walk, which is continuous along the harbor's edge. What is the average kind of monthly tide down here at elevation four, Harbor Walk at elevation 10, and then the predicted sea level rise, you know, the nine inches at 12 and 40 inches. And so the city is really looking to uh, get to a point where we're protecting probably 12 inches of 12 inches above the 40 inch barrier. So we looked at a variety of different solutions. One of which is this um, allowing the harbor walk in the in the front area to flood, uh, tying that uh, permanent kind of pat, what we call passive or permanent solution into the adjacent park and creating what's a deployable floodgate. So this is permanent, the wall is here always, and when there's concern, uh, this requires somebody to then come out and implement the gate, put a gate in place that then protects this additional area. This next solution, option two, uh, takes a different tack where it says, okay, the harbor walk is gonna continue to be floodable, but we're gonna introduce an element here that is kind of a wall, but it's also kind of an element that people can take advantage of on on you know most normal days it can be served as a bleacher where people can hang out adjacent to the um, children's museum and gather and socialize and so forth and yet provides that additional protection again multiple benefits of infrastructure investment or we could take a more um, holistic approach put the barrier at the outside this shows a more green in or a gray infrastructure where it's just simply a wall protecting everything inland of the including the harbor walk and then a more ambitious approach, which again is this land building where it's kind of moving into uh, the Four Point Channel, creating living shoreline there, and then having it as a, also as a public amenity as an additional habitat along the Four Point Channel edge. So we're gonna go from kind of this uh, larger planning studies to a couple of projects that we've worked on um, that uh, take existing sites and improve their resiliency and their environmental benefits. The first site we're gonna look at is down along the Neponset River, almost to Quincy, uh, Dorchester being here, um, JFK Library and so forth up in this area, and adjacent, right adjacent to the Neponset River. This site uh, here was historically, uh, had different uses through time, but um, is most known for being uh, a significant paper plant um, in which there was a lot of contamination that occurred on the site. Um, and so 
Uh, DCR became owner of this property, um, which was Division of Conservation Resources for the state of Massachusetts. They wanted to make it into a public uh, amenity and um, adjacent to the community. And they also were interested in kind of seeing how we could create a more resilient, naturalized uh, living shoreline along the edge of the Neponset River. So uh, just going back, so this being kind of the living shoreline that we're gonna be talking about, I just wanted to do a little primer on living shorelines. Living shorelines are great sources um, and we have them all really uh, throughout the Great Marsh here, but um, they're great sources of uh, storing carbon. They trap sediment. They provide great uh, opportunity for habitat and biodiversity as well as recreation. Um, uh, living shorelines in the form of marshes and oyster reefs are actually great absorbers of wave energy during normal times and also during kind of storm events. Um, and they're uh, more resilient than um, gray infrastructure. But our tendency has been through time to uh, more harden our shorelines. Uh, in fact, it's anticipated that 33% uh, of our shorelines in the U.S. will be hardened um, by, the, by 2100. So looking at green, green infrastructure instead, this is the existing edge of that uh, Schaefer paper site. On the uphill side was some Phragmites, some invasive species here, and kind of a degraded, you can see degraded and eroded shoreline. So we were able to come in uh, working with a local um, environmental consultant, Mike DeRosa from Ipswich, and we were able to regrade, uh, remove the invasives mechanically, replant with Spartina here, um, and then after you know a period of about two years, get this uh, living shoreline to establish. And then this is the upland side of that park as a recreational resource for the community. Now we're gonna move downtown to a more uh, highly developed site. Um, also, again, highlighting it's kind of the opportunity for benefits. Um, uh, this is the East Boston, uh, uh, Harbor Edge, uh, directly across from kind of, you'll probably know more readily, Marriott Long Wharf, the Aquarium, uh, and uh, Christopher Columbus Park. It's, um, this is the site in its prior condition. Uh, it too had, uh, like many of our waterfronts, just like Newburyport's waterfront, had a lot of industrial uses uh, that resulted in the, those prior uses once either going away or abandoning the site left uh, degraded environmental contamination. This site happened to be particularly blessed with asbestos contamination. So that the cost of that as well as real estate values up until the you know, past decade made development in East Boston not as practical. But um, given the current, uh, up till now, the current real estate increase in East Boston made this site practical for redevelopment. So this redevelopment was facing both the kind of environmental issues, some grade, as well as being adjacent to the harbor uh, with uh, um, sea level rise issues and climate change issues facing it. So one of the things that city of Boston now is looking at is the idea that um, new development has to plan for sea level rise. In fact, it has to design for what I described as uh, for commercial uh, applications, it has to plan for 40 inches of sea level rise, but plus what they call 12 inches of freeboard, which is in addition to that 40 inches of sea level rise, it's got to plan for additional 12 inches for, for establishing what is the floor level of commercial structures. That is increased by to 24 inches over the 12 inches for residential structures. So when this project was being developed, um, given the environmental conditions, it was also beneficial to raise up the finished floor elevations of the site as to not to get it down into the contaminants. So there's parking garage underneath it. So one of the benefits of building along the harbor is there's the commitment to chapter 91, uh, which requires public access all along the site. So you will notice as I show you some of this, there's some terrific public access improvements that the developer is committed to within this whole site, both along its perimeter as well as in the center of the site. And so I was gonna show you some of, you know, this is a view from the harbor's edge looking back with kind of a living shoreline and a built up amphitheater area. And then this is the kind of final product, which was just completed within the past year, all residential, uh, some condos and some apartment buildings. 
we were able to salvage a lot of the granite block that was used in the seawall of the project to reclaim and reutilize in this kind of stepped amphitheater that steps down to the living shoreline. Now we're going to look back in the other direction. And here you see the amphitheater stepping down into, again, kind of a terraced living shoreline where the water comes up, is able to flood, uh, where we again have Spartina and some kind of transitional coastal edge plantings along here. Now I'm going to focus out in this area, out beyond the edge of the development. One of the fun parts about this the development is that the developer wanted to challenge ourselves to make this a really distinct uh, project. And so this project had a decaying seawall out at the edge of the perimeter sticking into the harbor. And instead of taking on the development rights and developing the project the whole way out to uh, closer to the sea, the water's edge, we talked about creating a living shoreline. Instead of filling, we actually excavated out this area and, and created a hole in part of the seawall to encourage the seawater to come in and for it to, uh, as the public is able to get close, we wanted to highlight for them this, you know, twice a day experience firsthand of the drama of kind of tidal change. And so I'm gonna show you a little cartoon of, you know, this is the site, this is the building projection, uh, and then this is the public walkway that goes around. And so this is kind of at low tide and there's a progression of the water infiltrating from the sides as it gets to mid tide and then progresses up to high tide so that at high tide, you essentially, when you're on this public walkway, feel like you're in the middle of the harbor. And so this is kind of the resultant condition where the living shoreline in the foreground, which is a, an environmental amenity, an ecological amenity, and a public amenity. And there's a kind of a, an interpretive panel that tells you kind of all about what is attempting to be accomplished here. And you've got a beautiful view of Boston Harbor in the, in the background. So again, a view of uh, Clippership Wharf in its prior condition before redevelopment, and then its kind of restored condition afterward. Now, all public infrastructure and green infrastructure isn't just isolated to the coastal areas, but uh, we're working on a couple projects in Cambridge, and Cambridge is very uh, strong in its belief of looking at complete streets, and complete streets is defined as kind of being more equitable about the cross-section of what occurs between the buildings on roadways between here and here it isn't just about getting vehicles moving, but it's about pedestrians, bikes, and buses, and vehicles equitably or more equitably. So uh, this, this street is called Western Avenue. It has a companion street, River Street. Western Avenue goes, as its name implies, goes west towards the Halst Harvard Alston campus from Central Square on the next parallel street over is River Street. This project is completed and we're now working on River Street in a similar vein, but what you'll see is on the right-hand side associated, this project has been driven by an infrastructure replacement project. So while those infrastructure is being replaced, we've been able to move it out into what was the edge of a travel lane and create a widened streetscape on the one side. So um, that has involved, again, rebuilding of infrastructure below grade, and then the above grade benefit is this. On the far side, you get an enhanced, you know, tree way, uh, tree zone, and public amenity zone along the street edge, sidewalk along the back edge, and then on a more enhanced uh, opposite side of the street where you've widened it more readily to accommodate bus shelters and uh, green infrastructure plantings of plantings uh, right along the street edge in, in, in association with where you eliminate parking. And so all of this is buffered. Uh, and then you get a very highly defined kind of bike, off-road bike uh, zone, a cycle track, separate and distinct from the uh, pedestrian circulation. And we place street trees in between that all over top of kind of a sand-based structural soil. So the trees are able to take advantage of a continuous bed of planting soil underneath. And then the cycle track is pervious asphalt. So what's that look like? in the completed condition. This is the completed condition. Again, you get a great uh, healthy row of street trees that's taking advantage of the fact that there's good soil underneath the whole thing, water infiltrating into it, and then periodic plantings that break up the width of the street overall. In addition to that, at certain points in the street, we were able to take advantage of uh, continuous planting beds along the edge 
and breaking the curb to allow stormwater to come in, green uh, stormwater to infiltrate here, sediment get dispersed, um, and nutrients get dispersed before it, the overflow heads into the public uh, uh, the public storm drain. So a couple pr project in Cambridge there. Now I'm just going to step back for a second and kind of look at bigger picture. You think these are interesting. I think it's really interesting to see what's being thought of around the globe, just to be really ambitious for a minute. So Copenhagen has experienced some pretty extensive flooding in the recent years, which has woken themselves up to, you know, having to take measures to combat that. So Copenhagen uh, is predicted to get essentially a 50%, up to a 50% increase in rainfall during the winter in com combination with almost a 50% reduction in uh, precipitation in the summer. So they're gonna have much greater drought conditions, but much greater precipitation conditions in the winter. And so um, this is one project of 300 projects in which they're looking at uh, redesigning some of their public open space to help accommodate that. So this is a project called Ivanhaven Park, a classic little park in which they've rebuilt each of these to have substantial infrastructure and water support capacity um, below grade where you don't see it in some places where you do see it. So one of the projects, this, this particular park here is being built kind of as a one meter down in park that can be a public amenity during most days. But when there's strong storm events, instead of stormwater going to uh, storm drains and being headed out to uh, uh, the river or flooding the local areas, given the capacity of storm drains, instead, the stormwater is fed to these particular locations, both here above grade and to these areas below grade. And just this one area is able to accommodate essentially the equivalent of 10 Olympic swimming pools. And then this water is slowly then released into versus rapidly released into the environment, slowly released. It can also be used uh, for street sweeping and for, for tree irrigation. Another pretty bold uh, move is in Bangkok where the city has developed uh, over much, much densely than it was over time. And, uh, and given its density and uh, amount of impervious surface has had a lot of environmental degradation and water runoff and erosion issues. And so they've taken the measure of kind of uh, akin to um, the Central Park vision for Central Park, which Central Park existed before the city did. In this instance, this is kind of a retroactive Central Park creating a 12 acre central park in the center of Bangkok, of which stormwater is captured along the main boulevard, the main boulevard re-envisioned as a greenway. And that stormwater uh, redirected much like the vision of kind of a tree and its roots coming out from it to this central park. And then that central park becomes a place where uh, it's a destination, you know, where there was lack of green space in the city, there is green space and it's productive green space for enhancing quality of life and contributing to the ecology of the city. And then more locally, looking at Portland, Oregon, I happen to be very fond of this uh, project in which uh, the site was excavated to where it was filled to try to harken back to its former ecological uh, basis of a, as Tanner Springs uh, in Portland around which there was development and this site uh, is both beautiful and functional in that it has environmental benefits and ecological benefits, provides habitat. Warm water from the adjacent sites is brought here where it can be pre-treated and captured instead of you know, overtaxing the municipality. And then you know, who's to say that green infrastructure can't be artful, the reuse of railroad ties as an art form within the site. So a lot of different benefits and then this site becomes such a destination that it has terrific economic impact to the area around it. Now coming to, coming back to uh, to our where we live and uh, and opportunities here. Thinking even modestly, I want to go back to we first uh, uh, Ellie Baker and I, uh, who's uh, a local woman who works for Horsley Witten Group. Uh, we presented this idea uh, to the city. It's, it's hard to believe that it's already ten years ago. That looked at um, the amount of large paved areas that we have in Newburyport. You know, any number of them. Uh, here you see highlighted from the Park and Ride Port Plaza. Anna Jake's Hospital, et cetera, um, that there's a lot of paved parking lots and uh, a lot of runoff, a lot of impervious surface heat islands. And uh, you know, what do they typically look like? They typically look like this. And how do we deal with stormwater? We often look at putting in subsurface 
highly expensive structured systems below grade to hold that water and so that it doesn't run off. You know, we're talking about as we look through time and, you know, as the reliance on personal vehicles potentially decreases and we hopefully head towards more public transportation, you know, are there opportunities? I'll, again, I will grant you that this is pretty visionary. Is there opportunities to remove selectively um, parking areas and provide green infrastructure? Well, you may say that's crazy. You may look then at this slide, which shows a pretty traditional parking lot, given that it's, even though it's tandem spaces, it's probably a corporate parking lot, but you've essentially reduced what could be 100% paving into about a 50% green, 50% hardscape to reduce and capture stormwater on site. Also within Newburyport, we're challenged by the fact that we've got High Street, which is high, and Merrimack Street, which is low, and we have a lot of wide roadways, be it Kent Street, Broad Street, Ting Street, State Street, et cetera, on down to the Federal Street to the south end. And so a lot of the challenges that we face, especially if you ask business owners downtown, is a lot of that water uh, during these storms that we've been talking about with high levels of infil uh, precipitation and uh, and um, runoff result in flowing down downhill from that, all as the water heads from High Street towards the river, you know. And if we think boldly, we think about kind of uh, projects that are, uh, again, parking to Portland, where we think about public streets and analog analogize that to what we've just talked about, and the ability to introduce green infrastructure where you can see kind of the curbs along the edge of the roadway allow for stormwater to penetrate, and then some of that stormwater is then captured, filtered, and held before it's released uh, and can be amenities for the landscape as well. And if we think about that along some of our existing streets, it's easy to picture those without much interruption in, in what exists there now. So what are the benefits of stormwater management? Again, they kind of retain water for a longer time period versus running off. Um, they reduce the amount of erosion. There's opportunity for groundwater recharge in a lot of our urban areas. We've depleted our groundwater, so that allows us to uh, kind of add back to our groundwater and increase base flows underground to store to streams. Um, in addition, these kind of solutions can be beautiful. They don't have to just be functional, but they can be beautiful. Uh, they serve to capture sediment uh, as runoff, capture organic contaminants, and um, uh, they kind of uh, if you look at them against the cost of subsurface infrastructure costs, uh, the costs are less significant. It just requires a commitment to maintenance, which is, you know, is a different mode of which from which we've been used to thinking. So if we look at opportunities, you know, if you think about Greenleaf Street along where the CVS is, expansive up amounts of asphalt, or couldn't there be opportunities to introduce elements like this that uh, allow for stormwater runoff and green infrastructure to take place? Also, again, along Kent Street and the broader streets, again, the idea of, you know, where we've got double-sided parking, some places selectively introducing, uh, replacing parking with some green infrastructure just to reduce the amount of stormwater that's running downhill towards uh, Merrimack Street and, and the river. So what's that look like in cross-section? Here's our kind of existing conditions where we got two-way travel parking on both sides. We've got an extra generous, uh, roadway width, we still can accommodate, you know, all that and yet have uh, stormwater treatment uh, in board of that. Um, so just to end where we're at with a few thoughts, if any of this is compelling to you and you found it interesting, what's, what kind of is going on right now and who's, who's kind of in the thought leaders in this? The, tr the Trust for Public Land, if you look them up on, on, uh, on the web, has got an interesting strategy of Connect, cool, absorb, and protect. So connect is about focusing on human connection through uh, multimodal connections, bike and ped, cooling through thinking about investments in our urban forests. Um, absorbing is thinking about, you know, the kind of surfaces that we've got. So we reduce runoff and protection is, is as we've discussed, strategies of sea level rise and, and uh, extreme climate protection. And how are they doing that? If you look on their website, Trust for Public Land, uh, they're doing a lot of GIS planning with a variety of different cities uh, throughout the country, including Boston and the, what they call the Metro Mayor's Conference that includes a lot of the cities that are closer to Boston. And, and some of their outputs are these kind of layered GIS uh, plans that are very useful on focusing where do we put our 
you know, capital investments that get the greatest impact. And so this is a layer that shows focused, you know, at, in red on those with the greatest need based on assessing a variety of those vulnerabilities. You know, and some of those layers include assessing where are the heat islands most extreme, where are the places that we may not often think about where there's structures, whether it be electrical substations uh, or um, sewage treatment plants um, or other uh, critical services or hospitals or police stations or fire stations that may be vulnerable to, to climate change and protecting those. So all those layer up to give us, you know, uh, assist us in assessing where investments are most needed. Another organization I wanna highlight, because I had said earlier on that one of the important things is to think about how we develop solutions that connect all the dots and don't leave gaps in between them is the uh, Mystic River Watershed Association, which is thinking about climate resiliency on a watershed uh, scale in which they're trying to get, I think it's the 13 communities that make up that watershed to think about solutions that don't just stop at the town borders, but cross over them. And so they're a very interesting group to follow in terms of, I think they're trying to set up, you know, be a, be a pro prototype that can be repeated, you know, throughout the state in terms of setting up a governance across the watershed level. And then in terms of funding, uh, this program has started as a kind of small uh, effort, but the mayor, uh, I mean, the governor and uh, the environmental secretary have started to get behind this. So that cities can become, and I think Newburyport is an MVP city already, they can get funding to um, uh, have municipal vulnerability uh, plans prepared and based upon the, the vulnerabilities identified in those plans, then submit grants uh, to address those issues as, as related to the priorities. And so this program is starting to ramp up in terms of the funding available to it. Um, but the continued challenge for the state and for all municipalities is kind of the governance and how they both raise the capital uh, for, for um, levying fees to pay for this, as well as uh, for the infrastructure, as well as long-term maintenance. So if that's not enough for you all, um, I hope that was of interest. And if you get any questions, happy to kind of chat more about it. So anybody who's interested in asking a question, feel free to come off mute at this point and, um, and speak your question or type it in the chat if you prefer. This is, this is David Jackfield. Um, what are your thoughts, Bob, on um, a design flood level that Newburyport should consider? If we talked about design flood level being FEMA base flood elevation plus sea level rise, I mean, what, what do you think we should be looking at uh, for new development uh, and then as a measure for uh, retrofitting? I'm not, I'm not as familiar with, um, I'm not as familiar with the uh, calculations as it relates to Newburyport, but I would think that they're not, uh, not far off of what Boston is, um, is thinking about. Um, I do know that, you know, FEMA tends to historically look in the rear view mirror, whereas much of the zoning and the changes in the thinking are based upon looking forward. So, um, so it's hard for me to project an exact elevation for you, but I would think that, um, you know, a, a projected um, horizon that is looking at kind of, again, similar to, you know, if, if we use Boston as kind of a model in which they've started to come around to some pretty progressive thinking about, you know, 40 inches of sea level rise plus, you know, plus freeboard, I think would be something that, you know, would, one would want to think about. Um, the other, the other notion is, is that um, in terms of how you think about the solutions that are placed, the, the, the importance is thinking about solutions that can also be modular, which means when you built them, that they're not, they haven't reached their ultimate, such that you could, in, in some scenario, add, be additive to them if the conditions got worse than what is currently anticipated. So that's kind of a lot of the current thinking of how do you create a solution that is um, 
you know, that can be in place and maybe isn't built to the ultimate height, but is built to a certain height such that, you know, it could be progressively added to as time goes on. Thank you. Bob, I think some of the solutions that you've been involved in in Boston are just beautiful. I hope we can leverage some of those as they're considering expanding the waterfront park and uh, different different areas of, of um, protection around town. Right, as you see, I think, you know, one of the challenges is, as one, you know, as the waterfront park uh, expansion is thought about will be that just that question of like okay what does one in there'll be different levels of investment opportunity you know do do, do we allow the, the river walk to be flooded you know as uh, as we look into the future or do we protect that if we if we protect that that has a different kind of uh, it has a different look and feel to what the edge of the harbor the river walk is now versus you know what it would be in that future or do we look to inboard of that, do we allow the river walk to be periodically flooded such that the protection occurs kind of inboard where the park is, such that the park is built up? I think one of the good benefits of, you know, the waterfront park and some of the challenges of, again, like some of this, all the sites that we talked about on these, you know, industrial waterfronts where there's contamination, the beauty is that it's going to be beneficial to build up because you'll be capping contaminants, but you'll also be building up which gives you a better view of the water and you'll be building up, which will create protection. The challenge will be that, you know, the, the waterfront park, if it's built up, will only protect that area, but you'll have vulnerabilities, you know, to either side of where that protection occurs. Hmm. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Anita Brewer. She's asking if, if people are looking into shifting some activities into the water as it rises, like floating housing or floating solar power structures or even agriculture. That's interesting. Um, I've I've seen it in a lot of the visionary discussions about kind of future. What the, what does the future of development look like? I haven't seen any uh, too many in application, so to speak. Hmm. I have seen some more floating, you know, floating wetlands, um, but much more on a smaller scale. I think they've actually introduced one into the Charles River recently. Great idea. Other questions. Yes, this is Bonnie Sontag. Hi, Bob. Hi, Bonnie. Um, um, I hear your uh, warning or, or, or um, idea that we should really have a complete resiliency plan and your comment right now about Waterfront Park is a good example of that. So you do something on one site and then it could have adverse effects um, on either side or elsewhere. Uh, my question is though, in the interim, given that we don't seem to have even in, in, unless I don't know about it, any initiatives going toward having a more expansive plan in Newburyport. Um, would you think it would be um, advisable to consider some land use zoning changes that would incorporate ideas for green infrastructure into projects through special permits or site plan review or something of that nature? Or would that potentially lead to more problems than if we just left it until we had a bigger plan for the whole city. That's a good question. Um, doing something is better than doing nothing, I think. Um, and I think, you know, the one thing is, is that there's this notion of, you know, you really can't, you can't, impact the ocean you know the ocean is going to fill wherever it's going to fill such that if you did work it i'm not necessarily saying so if you did waterfront park would it adversely affect you know otherwise because it's not like because you're filling market landing park uh in and raising it up that you're actually going to affect what the ocean fills because the ocean's going to fill one way or another you know if those elevations are lower around it it's still going to fill those elevations not just because you've added land to you know to the ocean in a in a one acre amount uh, that said, I think, you know, any strategies that can be forward thinking relative to uh, zoning and, um, and, and looking at, um, you know, changes to development, uh, I think are, are both wise and, and proactive. I think, you know, again, I think some of the, the things that uh, Boston has been looking at are, you know, really smart. I think, 
the more we can introduce green infrastructure both into our site and into our architecture, you know, the better off we're going to be because it's going to not just a sea level rise, but in just, you know, any number of environmental benefits. I'm, I'm just kind of been amazed that Boston hasn't gone along with other cities and required green roofs on any of its new construction mm -hmm. or retrofitted construction because I think that's an easy, easy win in a lot of regards. Thank you. Other questions for Bob? The other thing I would add is some of these, I think the, you know, one of the challenges that, um, that you'll start to see that there's a, there's an organization that you, you may or may not know of. So the Barr Foundation has funded a lot of these studies with the city of Boston. And there's a, another organization called the Green Ribbon Commission in Boston, all of which are kind of looking at, you know, next steps. There's been a lot of kind of planning, I think, um, fatigue, you know, uh, you'll see a lot of these uh, climate ready projects that have been planned for, but people are saying, okay, when are we going to get to implementation? So I think there's getting to be a lot more focus both at the governor's level um, and at other agency levels to try to figure out, okay, what does this look like in terms of how do we, how do we, how do we both, you know, it's going to require additional investment. So are those investments on a regional scale and how do we, so to speak, levy uh, those folks that are right at the water versus those folks that are in board of the water? because those that are at the water's edge, so to speak, are more prone to it, but they're in effect, if they invest, they are protecting people inboard. So there's, I think there's the thinking about, you know, an equal levy across that, uh, but that's, you know, that's still a, there's a lot of calculations going on and a lot of people thinking based upon other precedents around the world. And there's also the idea of a storm, you know, like a, we have sewer and water uh, taxes that we pay. I think there's a lot of thinking about uh, stormwater uh, taxes, and those taxes are often based, uh, have some basis on a factor of how uh, pervious or impervious your site is. So if your site is highly impervious, your, your rate uh, of taxing is higher if your site is, um, accommodates stormwater much more readily, your tax rate is much lower. So it kind of encourages you to uh, be more um, environmentally friendly, so to speak. Just to repeat a couple of um, questions that we answered in the chat, um, Bob's presentation is being recorded and it's being shown tonight or um, and will be repeated on some of the local cable TV channels. It's also um, will end up on the Storm Surge YouTube channel and there's a link to that archive on the Storm Surge webpage. Um, so you'll be able to find it and share it if, if you'd like to. Uh, Bob, have you have you had a chance to look at the new report, Climate Resiliency Plan? Um, it's only recently been uh, released, but I wondered if you'd had a look at that. I have not. I have not. I probably I okay. should probably take a shot at that, but I haven't I haven't looked at it yet. No. Right. I, I don't think it's widely circulated. Um, it is on the it is on the city uh, website. Um, and and basically does reflect you know the MVP because new as you were said new report is MVP certified and did produce an MVP plan and, and a lot of the recommendations in the resiliency plan are similar to the MVP uh, plan as you would as you would expect um, mm -hmm. so yeah it would be good if if you could take a look and feedback would be welcomed I think. I'll try to do that. It's rather interesting because uh, Boston right now has released its first uh, RFP for actually an implementation project in East Boston right to adj adjacent to the project that I just showed you. So one of the challenges has been uh, that there's a couple development projects, Clippership Wharf, uh, which in and of itself is resilient and then there's another project adjacent to it that has been built on essentially on either side and what else would you expect but the the areas that are um, vulnerable are the kind of roadways that are adjacent to it that are left down to grade and so there's a RFP out now to study you know what are the resiliency measures that could bring uh, those uh, areas and ideally in a passive solution one that is fixed 
and not deployable cool. that could address, you know, could achieve the 2040, <laughs> the, the 40 inches of sea level rise. Bob, it looks like Susan has a question. Susan, would you like to ask your question? No, actually, it's Ed Hand. Susan's my wife. Got it. Uh, we were well familiar with Newbury Port since I have a brother-in-law who lives there, and uh, my father-in-law uh, owned Lowell's Boat Shop for quite a while and turned it into a working museum. But uh, my question is, we live in Rockport, and we're about to enter a contract, I think, with uh, MAPC to uh, do a review of our zoning. And I'm wondering about if there are any good examples of community, seaside communities who've done a good job from a zoning standpoint to address an earlier question about zoning uh, that addresses some of these issues. I, am, I will admit that that zoning is not an area of my expertise. So I, um, though M MAPC is a good outfit to, uh, you know, they've got a bit breadth of experience. They're, um, they're probably involved in the Trust for Public Land uh, efforts that I was talking about. Okay. Um, so I think that they would probably be, you know, have a, have a wealth of resources to, to draw from. Um, Rick, you don't have any thoughts on that one, do you? I don't, <laughs> but I do have a question for you. Okay. Uh, do you have any good examples of um, uh, standards or guidelines for communities as they're um, redoing their streets uh, and so forth? The, you know, your, your uh, idea is looking at some of the, the cross streets going down from um, high to Merrimack or to, or to water are great, but uh, I think that we need a little bit more help in, mm -hmm. in learning how to think in a more forward looking fashion. Uh, so I was just wondering whether there are other communities you know of that have kind of a cookbook of how to, um, you know, when you're, when you're looking at redoing a street or repaving a street or doing some street tree work or something like that, um, what types of uh, ways you might look at introducing rain gardens or other types of green infrastructure? Because that, that really is something that, you know, we have, the, we have a wealth of wide streets and uh, we don't really need all that, that width. Uh, so we could really recapture some of that for green infrastructure. I'm trying, Boston has the complete streets manual, which is a pretty good manual, but I don't know that it's necessarily tailored to what you're asking. I'd have to look. I also think they have a green infrastructure guidelines, and I, would, I haven't really looked deeply into it, but I'd have to look and see whether it has that. You know, Cam Cambridge uh, is often at the forefront of many of these things, so um, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you about it further. Um, but those are the two kind of resources that I often go to relative to, you know, what the latest thinking is on, uh, on if you can call it prototypes that right. are, or models. Thanks. Okay, well, we're at the top of the hour. Um, is that, are there any other questions at this point? Sheila, do you want to take over? Yes, I was just trying to, but I was muted. Oh, I've taken care of that. So Bob, on behalf of Storm Surge, Newburyport, Liverpool Streets, and all of us watching live, I want to thank you for such an illuminating and interesting presentation. It really is inspiring to see examples of what can be done for useful purposes, but also for beauty. You've given us lots of thought for food for thought for what we can do here in Newburyport. I hope our audience members will join us for a wonderful follow-up program on planning for resilience on the third Thursday in December. Steve Whitman and Liz Kelly of Resilience Planning and Design will talk about what resilience looks like on the ground and how it can be used to address food security, climate change, natural resource protection, and equity related issues. So I think it's a wonderful follow-up to what Bob has done tonight. I want to thank you all for coming and good night. And I hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving. <laughs>